uh, parabolic on the top left, um, box cooker, top right, panel cooker here, uh, and this is a, an evacuated tube cooker. And uh, I'll be concentrating on, on these in this talk. Uh, all solar cookers have the same job to do. They need to reflect sunlight onto a black or dark colored target. Up here, you can see a kettle, uh, a pot here in the box cooker, another pot here in the panel cooker, and in the uh, evacuated tube cooker, which is really an oven because it's the space inside, the air inside which heats up and the surface inside which heats up. Um, uh, a black surface here that you can see. Okay, um, the second job that uh, Segi's already mentioned that solar cookers have to do is that once the, uh, the target pot starts to heat up, they have to uh, try and hold on to that heat so that the food or the water can continue to cook or to heat up. Usually parabolic cookers uh, have such a large reflector area that they don't bother to try and insulate the, the pot. They don't usually have anything, any, any method of uh, uh, stopping the heat from escaping. Box cookers, as you know, have uh, insulation uh, around the sides of the box. Oops, go back. <laughs> Uh, and panel cookers, you, it's conventional to use a, a heat trap. I seem to be having difficulty with this. It's conventional to have a, a heat trap. Um, these are the uh, evacuated tube cookers are the cookers which have the best insulation. And uh, what I want to do is just talk about how we got uh, to this type of cooker historically. So here's the technology that's in use. Uh, James Dewar was a, a Scottish scientist who was interested in heat transfer. Um, and he invented this flask, which has uh, a vacuum in this gray area here, which prevents heat uh, crossing from here to here by convection. If there's air in there, uh, air currents can carry heat from the internal vessel to the external vessel here. Also notice that the opportunity for uh, heat transfer by conduction is, is very small. The only place that heat can be conducted outside is in this area here on both sides of this. Um, so this is a, a very, very efficient way of keeping stuff hot. Uh, James Dewar had uh, a glass blower working in his laboratory, a German glass blower, incidentally, uh, who got together with another glass blower and uh, they together made a company that started making these out of glass. And that's the company, the Thermos. This is uh, still going, this company. You're acquainted with these uh, flasks, you keep your coffee in them, and it stays hot for a long time. Um, let's go take a step forward to this chap who made what he called, if you look at the bottom right of the screen, you'll see he called this a toy solar cooker. And this is just a working model of a, a very big system that he put in his house uh, in was near Washington, DC. Um, the reflector was something like uh, two meter, two and a half meters by two meters. And, but he used the same system. And you see here um, a reflector and a, a tube and another tube inside with a, a dark liquid in it. And there's a vacuum between the two tubes. Now he wasn't cooking inside this tube. He was using this to uh, generate heat from the sun in the black liquid. And this was then by convection heating this oven this well insulated oven that he has up here. We go forward to 1959 and this is uh, an American patent for uh, a hot water heating system. And if you look at the section diagram on the bottom right here, you'll see uh, that this is the tube, there's a vacuum inside it and it has a squashed black 
pipe with what they're calling a selective surface. And I will uh, talk about that in a minute. But basically, liquid goes down one side of the pipe, comes up the other, and heats up in the process, and it ends up near these metal ends here, which can be then used to heat water. So let's look at a modern glass evacuated tube. Um, you see here on the top uh, two glass tubes. There's one, and the, the inner one is coated with one, two, three coats. And these coats form what's called a selective surface. Uh, the, the first coating uh, is copper, uh, the second is aluminium nitride, and the third is a uh, anti-reflection surface that that, prop, uh, that stops um, light, sunlight being reflected away. And together, they have an interesting property. If you if you look inside the the, the tube, by the way, you can see the copper, the, the copper layer. And if you look on the outside of the tube, it looks like this, like this layer is on the outside. And you can see there that there's an inner tube and then a gap and then the outer tube. And a selective surface has the property of absorbing a large proportion of the energy from sunlight that strikes it. Uh, but once it heats up, it only emits a very small proportion of the amount of uh, radiant heat which it should for a body of that temperature. Um, this is the, the third way in which these tubes very efficiently hold on to heat that they've, they have absorbed from the sun. This is the uh, configuration for uh, a solar hot water heater for a domestic uh, house. Um, as you see, we have the gray area here which is the vacuum part, then an inner tube, and then within that, another tube, which has a liquid in it, which heats up in the sun, and then um, by convection, ugh, by convection moves the heat up into this uh, metal area just here. Uh, and then, these tubes are put in groups on roofs. I expect you, you've already have, we've seen pictures of roofs on your, on your building. And these trans, the, the heat is transferred to uh, water, which runs across the top uh, to be stored in a tank for showers or washing, uh, washing up or whatever. Um, the Chinese have automated the production of these tubes. And uh, I just want to draw your attention to the number that they made. Even in 2009, they made more than eight square kilometers of them. That's a huge area. They have a very large domestic market for these tubes. You can see them here. And these are all the, the hot water tubes, which um, you see mounted on, on roofs. So. Coming forward to 2006, uh, a Malaysian called Alex Key uh, came along to a uh, uh, conference in uh, Spain, and he suggested, and as far as I know, he was the first one to suggest this, he suggested that you should get these tubes and you should use them to heat water uh, and pasteurize it in areas of the world where the water supply wasn't safe. Um, but significantly, in the, exactly the same paper that he presented, he also suggested that you could cook inside them. And this is the first uh, picture that I know about that has uh, proof that someone is actually cooking something inside these evacuated tubes. And uh, I don't like the look of that uh, pizza, but it's, uh, <laughs> it's the first one. So we'll let him off. Um, Coming forward to 2014, we've already got on the right uh, a kind of convenient finished solar cooker based on an evacuated tube, but also on the market at that time, 
a much larger, bigger diameter tube, which you can get more food in. It's a bit more convenient to use because in the small tube, you can really only put sausages or food that you've chopped up small. Whereas in the big tube, you know, you can get whole bits of meat in there all at once. Um, these are the RAND tubes that uh, were marketed in America and, and still are, as far as I know. OK, by themselves, one of these large diameter tubes act as a slow cooker. You can leave food in this for two to four hours, as long as the sun is shining, and uh, it will cook. It will cook perfectly well. Um, but what if we add a reflector? Um, at the moment, you can see that just, if you like, one sun is shining on this tube. But what if we go to eight suns? Here on the right is a reflector that is capable of putting eight suns onto one of those tubes. And when we do this, we find that um, you can cook a half kilogram loaf in 35 minutes uh, at 200 centigrade. Right, and that is in the UK uh, in winter. So if it's sunny in winter, you can cook this loaf. So this is the question of the day, and I'm gonna hand over to Stuart to, uh, to address this. Why hasn't everyone got one? Stuart. Dave, can you, uh, hello everybody. Dave, can you uh, yeah. go out of shared screen? Yeah. Great stuff. And uh, can everybody hear me? Yep. You'll hear me. Okay. Nice. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Dave. Um, and uh, today, well, Dave was talking about the scientific background for uh, solar evacuated tubes. Um, and you know, today I'm going to be talking about some of the uh, more practical and commercial aspects. Um, of uh, these evacuated tubes that we've been working with for quite some time now. Uh, so I'm going to share my screen. Um, share screen. There we go. Um, beg pardon. Slide, slideshow. Let's get that out of the way. Slideshow. Right. Okay. So these evacuated tubes are very efficient, very good for solar cooking, as we've uh, seen demonstrated with that excellent loaf of Dave's. Why doesn't everybody have one? Well, for a start, who knows about them? Okay. During the last six years, uh, we at uh, Slick, Dave and myself, have done our very best to raise awareness about solar cooking. We go to um, festivals, where thousands of people have seen our cookers, our cooker display, which we're very happy to um, put out. Uh, when, and we put them out in the rain or the sun. In the summertime, we get lots of sun. So um, it's actually a very pleasant environment. They're very shiny and they attract a lot of attention. We talk to uh, hundreds and hundreds of people about them. It's a really good way of finding out what uh, people think about solar cookers. We've, we've cooked in public many, many times over the years at these festivals, demonstrations, green events, fashion shoots. We, we've even cooked in the garden of a, of a TV chef um, who you know, gets, um, gets his name around on all the network channels. Um, but after all this time on this, um, what do we know about the British public who we've been talking to over these years? Uh, in the UK, our experience is that um, sometimes they try to put their hands on our kettle to see whether it's really hot. They can hear the water boiling, but they still don't believe it. So even if they know about them, they don't really believe that they work in the UK. It looks like magic. When, why hasn't everybody got one? Maybe it's something to do with the glass that they are made out of. When people realize that evacuated tubes are made out of glass, they wonder if they will break. They wonder if they are durable. 
by using this cooking devices. Now, we have deliberately tested the limits of these tubes. Dave still has the RAN tube that we imported in 2014, and he has cooked several hundred loaves in it. If you use them correctly, they're going to last for years, but there is a risk that they will break in transit. We found that large consignments of glass evacuated tubes arrived in one piece. No tubes were broken. Small numbers of tubes like this one in the picture are more likely to arrive in pieces. This means that it's quite risky to distribute them to individual customers. Even so, we have only seen a few breakages in the postal service in the UK. Now, the next cooker I'm going to show is a Chinese prototype that they sent us for testing. Well, we tested it. We learned that a couple of lessons from this one. First, that this inclined design isn't very good, it's useless. The food falls out of the tray because of gravity, especially when it gets hot and slidey and it falls onto the hot glass. This is, we think, why this shattered. The second thing we learned was not to do this in public. It's not very attractive, it's not very pretty. So we tested the next tube because we'd heard about thermal shock. We tested this next tube with food from the freezer. Boom. Food from the freezer is at minus 18 degrees centigrade. The glass in these tubes heats up very quickly. Now frozen food is too cold to keep up with this temperature rise. When the glass gets around at 190 degrees C, hotter than the food, this happens. It's called thermal shock. So never try to cook frozen food in one of these tubes. Thaw it completely first. Don't take the chance. Next up, don't add cold liquids to a hot tube, as this lady discovered. This was a televised cooking competition in the USA, where they took some solar cookers out into the hot deserts of Arizona. Uh, it must get pretty hot out there. These tubes would have cooked up, um, got really hot, extremely fast, uh, right to the, um, the de design limits of, of where they can go. And nobody told this contestant about thermal shock. Here you can see they're putting some uh, vegetable oil into the cooking tube. Um, and this is the result. Boom, once again. Finally, even if you are careful, there might be some scratches or it's very small cracks or small cracks have developed in transit um, in a tube. Um, and here, here's, uh, here's a picture of a tube. Uh, you can see down here, a very, very small crack. This, this tube had been sitting up on my uh, wall of my house where I put it for convenience um, for a few years. And I hadn't even noticed this small crack here. Here it is uh, in January, uh, in the UK in January, uh, a couple of days before this, but on a very, cold night. Remember, this is mounted on a wall outside my bedroom. Um, on a very cold night where it got to minus four degrees C, I, I had a, a loud explosion which woke me up. And I went back to bed. I went back to sleep. Uh, but in the next morning, I uh, found out where it was. <laughs> Bang! Here is what was left of the tube. You can see the mounting ring up here on the uh, on the right. Um, obviously, uh, this, this tube cannot be recycled. It's useless, it's done, it's finished. It must be thrown away like a broken light bulb or a, a used battery. Um, it's no good anymore. So we tried to market solar cookers in the UK. Uh, we, we were still trying here and there, but there is a financial risk for individuals to do this. Um, 
what are those risks? Well, here are 100 uh, of the SM70 tube cookers that we imported in 2015. They didn't really sell very fast. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. We only sold a quarter of them in the UK. Well, nobody in the UK knew about them. Um, and we sold the rest of them abroad in, in Europe. Um, there is quite a large difference in price between the large solar cooking tubes that we, we use for cooking and the, the thin hot water tubes, um, which Dave showed earlier, uh, which are um, produced in, in large volumes. Because there's not a large market for our tube cookers, not many are made. And so that means that they're quite expensive to buy. It is actually quite easy to get cheap replacement tubes for your rooftop mounted solar water system. It's like replacing a light bulb, but it's expensive to get large tubes. But what about the price of the finished tube cookers like the uh, SM70 we showed you? Market prices. Well, perhaps um, it's possible that uh, this is putting people off uh, from buying them. They're, they're not uh, cheap enough for the market. Here's, a, here's some, some solar cooking tubes. At the bottom, you can see uh, this recent uh, production, the Gosun Sizzle, uh, which is uh, produced in China um, as a unit. It's, um, it's $800, uh, 660 euros, 570 pounds. Uh, in the, on the left, here's a DIY version from Montenegro. And on the, uh, on the right, uh, the, uh, another DIY version from the UK, Dave's uh, 8 to 1 Tilty. Uh, you can, the one in the UK is made for about one quarter of the price of the commercial one down below. The only part you can't make yourself is the tube. And now this is the tube that was imported uh, in 2014. So what we call this in the UK, a chicken and egg problem. You need a chicken to get an egg, but you need an egg to get a chicken. Let's, can we think of some solutions? Because we're, we're at a bottleneck here. Right, so I'm gonna talk about a few, a few potential solutions and potential reasons why, um, why we haven't been able to um, to spread uh, these, these cooking tubes as widely as we'd like to. Now, solar, solar cooking tubes are the most efficient way of getting cooking heat from sunlight. They're, they're a high quality solution for solar cooking in Europe, even in the north of Europe. This should be good business for on, local entrepreneurs and for local makers, fabricators. But, Solar tubes are very brittle and their trade is depressed by the fear of glass, what I call glass risk. What's glass risk? Glass risk is that they're gonna break in shipping as we've seen, they're gonna break in import, uh, they're gonna break in use. So this, this adds uh, a risk factor. Um, another risky factor is that uh, solar tubes suitable for cooking are made only in the Far East, in China. Resupply is consuming, it's costly, and it's risky. These are long supply lines. Now, third factor is that solar tubes for cooking are not well known enough to support an economy of scale for an individual buyer. There's no real volume sales. Let's have a quick, Think about what a solar evacuated tube cooker is. In simple terms, a solar tube cooker has two parts. What are those parts? Number one, the evacuated tube, which can be of various sizes and dimensions. And two, everything else, a focusing reflector, a tube carrier, something to hold the tube. There are many, many designs which exist um, at the moment. And there'll probably be many more in the future. You have so, five minutes hello? left. Hello? Five minutes left. Uh -huh. 
I can't hear anything. Um, so there are five more minutes for you. Hello. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, thank you. So I'll, I'll be quick. Uh, so for number one for the tube, there are no EU makers or suppliers of solar tubes. But for number two, everything else that's needed can be locally made or supplied in Europe. Light, light fittings need light bulbs and battery devices need batteries. These are consumables. They are of standard size and therefore they can be easily replaced. But solar tube cookers need solar tubes. Right now, a broken solar cooking tube in Europe cannot easily be cheaply and cheaply be replaced. So standard size hot water solar tubes are abundant, the ones on the roof, and they can be replaced if broken. Not, not, no solar tubes for cooking. So how can we address this? Here's a couple of suggestions. One, that we talk about, we establish a standard size solar cooking tubes protocol, like battery sizes, AA, AAA, D, etc. This will be a start. And number two, we work to establish a Europe area supply of standard size tubes, imported in quantity for best economy of scale and the reduction of glass risk. Therefore, supply will be assured to individual makers or larger scale solar cooker manufacturers or as replacements for tubes that are broken in use. Makers and fabricators can add value at smaller scale with the security of knowing that volume tube supply will remain in the market to support their designs. Now, can an individual or a private company provide this tube supply service or is the financial risk too high? In 2011, the United Nations funded the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves to financially support a tube cooker manufacturer, Goson, to create a market for tube cookers. This was focused on one brand only, and it has had limited, very limited impact to date, but it shows how support has been possible in the past. But there remains the bottleneck of no tubes available in Europe. And this is holding back solar tube cooking development the question is, how can we provide a solar tube resource in Europe to stimulate the growth of the most efficient method of solar cooking that we have? So we've offered a few suggestions, but we don't have all the answers. And we invite collaboration. We select invite collaboration in this. And we'd be happy to talk to anybody about doing this. And that's um, that's the end of the presentation uh, here. Um, right, resume share. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> okay.